So Nicole, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview. Um, as you know, the, the mission of the Wellness Moonshot is to create a world free of preventable disease, and that is an enormous an audacious goal. Um, I, I don't know in my lifetime if we'll achieve that goal when we look at 8 billion people on the planet, but it is such a worthy, meaningful aim to, to strive toward. And with your background in technology, human potential, human flourishing, and all the intersections that that leads you to, I thought it would be great to talk to you about um, technology and the intersection of wellness and well being. Oh, great. Great, that's my passion, so thank you. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you again for taking the time. So my first question is, how do you see technology being used to decrease human suffering and enhancing our capacity to thrive? And I'd love your big thoughts on that, but also any examples you can give to this. We, we've got a broad community that listens to these videos. Um, so any examples you can give will really ground it for all of us. Yeah, I would say, you know, the the base case around human suffering uh, is really around human health and uh, moving from a focus on lifespan to health span and really what are the ways that we can do that. One of the things I talk about in, in many of my talks is um, a new definition for what's called deep technology. Uh, deep technology used to be sort of like space focused technology, essentially non-consumer facing tech. But one of the things that people are starting to talk about when they talk about deep is a level of precision um, that comes from um, the amount of data that's available. Now, right now we're awash in data and not a lot of insight. Um, so I think, you know, like the very next step is going to be having that data really be insight about health and, and uh, preventative health uh, in a very personalized way so that people can get either the exact advice that they need or the exact intervention that they need if they have a disease. And that on its own will go a really long way. I mean, one of the issues that we have, especially in the United States, is that our healthcare costs are out of control. Um, and part of that is, it's a very complex issue around, that includes a lack of transparency around pricing so people can't actually shop for better pricing um, and just, you know, there's a lot of incentives that are not aligned for it to be a more manageable situation. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, I think the first layer that you're going to see is really technology around better health prevention and better health intervention. Um, you know, and another definition for suffering, of course, includes the psychological suffering. And I think you're starting to really see a lot of um, good interventions around and support using technology around mental health. Um, and, you know, we're starting to really see, um, you know, some of the, I guess the first wave of that post or that COVID related tsunami of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that's really just getting going. Um, and so, you know, the good news is that during those two years of the pandemic, people got really used to the idea of using tech. Uh, so you're going to see more mental health platforms, more and more personalized types of interventions. You're starting to see segmentation around the interventions like mental health for people of color, you know, mental health for, you know, people of different subgroups. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think you'll see more support around mental health. Um, and then around emotional health, um, I think we're going to see, which I, I see as a little bit more preventative and more uh, almost training. Um, you're starting to see uh, people paying more attention to that, but it's in the context of, of um, the leading edge is really around remote work, you know, because when people say culture as it relates to remote work, they're really talking about the emotional health of an organization. Mm. And since remote work is not going away, you're going to see better and more applications that are in that category. And then I would say finally, the last category, um, you know, which is the operative opposite of suffering, which is sort of like real deep flourishing mm -hmm. um, and aliveness. Um, I, I think we're really just at the very beginning of people looking into performance 
as it relates to that. And so that's kind of the full spectrum, you know, from health to happiness to uh, flourishing uh, with technology and wellness. That's awesome. And I, 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 you know, you and I talked many years ago about this and what I appreciated about our conversation then that I appreciate now is how you really are looking at a continuum mm -hmm. and that they're all connected. So when, so you get more clear about when we're talking about wellness, we're not just talking about one thing. There is a whole continuum to take a look at. So I just, I just appreciate that you brought that up again in this conversation. Are there any technologies that particularly excite you? So you talked about the kind of the categories that are emerging, but are there any technologies that really excite you? Yeah, I, um, I think you might probably remember that my background is in video games mm -hmm. before I got into this. And I am such a believer in uh, video games and quote unquote, the metaverse as a um as a widespread tool for transformation and um uh, one company there's a a company that i i'm just in love with um uh, called lightforge and it's a game company uh, but basically what they're doing is um it's sort of like you know um small group based storytelling hmm. and that doesn't seem like you know, on the surface, that doesn't seem like a wellness intervention, but um, I recently have been reading a lot about human emotion. And there's this really great book called How Emotions Are Made mm -hmm. uh, and the science in it is so stellar. And it's sort of like, you know, cultures that don't have names or words for certain emotions don't actually have those emotions. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And so we really construct emotions in any moment using language you know like language really does that and so you know what small group based storytelling does is that if you really teach young people how to become storytellers even in a game-based sort of like dungeon master like dnd type format mm -hmm. um then the use of language the use of storytelling like if you if for play you teach people how to become storytellers, then I believe their ability to tell their own story mm -hmm. dramatically improves. The reauthoring, you know, that it takes to overcome trauma, you know, the reauthoring that it takes to, you know, to respond to the vicissitudes of human life. Mm -hmm. or to you know really decide what your purpose is like language is our os and so you know it looks like you know an adult from the outside might look at it and be like how is that a wellness application how is that a um transformative application i absolutely see it that way um and you know if you think about the people that you've known who have overcome a, a terrible situation um, or, you know, even people who have on the other side of an addiction, once the physiological, you know, uh, addiction has slowed down, what really makes people change is when their story about themselves changes. Mm -hmm. That's really when it becomes theirs. And so storytelling is core to who we are and about that it looks like a game but i think it's um i think it would be um transformative for a whole generation yeah i am so in agreement on so many levels with what you're saying as far as storytelling um one level is i just think about in my own experience going through a trauma about 16 years ago and coming out of that trauma with um with a significant um disease diagnosis and about the same time i got this diagnosis i met a woman who i didn't really know that well but for some reason i we got into the conversation about what i was dealing with and she said renee the one thing i will tell you is don't let yourself crystallize around that label or that story right now just don't let 
your, your, your thinking or anything crystallize around that particular label and the story around it. Because if you do, that's going to take you around, down one particular path. Mm-hmm. And the moment she said it, it was so, it rang so true in me that I never did. I would say, I'm dealing with X, but I would never say, I have, or I am, or, and um, just that alone, it seems so simple, but just that alone was so significant for me personally and all the options that I would then experiment with to deal with the symptoms that I was dealing with to a point where, you know, 16 years later today, it's not something I deal with at all. And not that that happens to everyone, but it, it's, a, it's a very practical example of the power of story and making a choice, mm-hmm. um, you know, right in that moment. Luckily, I met this woman in that moment. The other way I relate to what you're talking about is just in the work that I, I know you've done through gaming and I've done in a different format in organizations um, and how people connect with each other and the, the power of relational well-being. And that, you know, comes through the stories we create together. So um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So are there any other technologies that you, that you're just super excited about right now? So you mentioned the, the one that's around creating stories in small groups. Mm. Yeah. You know, one of the, uh, one of the other, um, you know, things that I'm really passionate about, actually uh, another speaker at the, at the um, conference this summer or this fall, um, Ari Peralta mm-hmm. is going to be speaking about color. Uh, and I think that, you know, human sensory perception, mm-hmm. um, using technology to actually turn those into interventions as opposed to, um, as opposed to, you know, just um, anecdotal um, mm, modalities for wellness, I think we're going to be able to actually make them um, science-backed interventions that are personalized. Hmm. Um, And so Ari's going to be talking about that um, at the conference um, in uh, Tel Aviv. And so I'm really excited about that. I've also, um, you know, I've also started investing. I don't know if you knew that. No. Um, So I have a fund called Neurimia Collective, and we invest in well-being and wellness technology for human potential. And so, of course, my entire portfolio I'm in love with. (laughs) You know, I just think that um, the founders are extraordinary. And, um, and so, you know, many of them are, you know, one company is called Skillprint. Its founders are from games um, and they are using games to help people really understand what they're passionate about and what they're good at. So think of it as kind of like a modern strength finder. Okay. Um, And, you know, the way initially they'll be using games that they make, but on some point eventually it would make sense that whatever you're doing online would be simultaneously um you know with your permission observing how you do things and what you do so that you could um be become clear about you know what you really like what you're good at and you know and eventually they will bring opportunities to you based on your games playing you know, one of the things that's like half the world plays games and everyone born today is a gamer. And so young people need a way to find what they're really passionate about and access opportunities that, you know, allow them to match their interests to what they're doing. So, you know, I, I love that. Um, there's another company that is um, really a great wellness solution uh, with alternative um healthcare opportunities, but, you know, it's set up to fit into, um, in a self-insured environment, like half the, you know, most of the small and mid cap companies, uh, many of them are, are, uh, self-insured. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, 
there really hasn't been a way for them to access wellness and alternative health care uh, for their employees who really want those things. Um, and so this is, you know, a really great company that's set up for that. So we have this broad portfolio that really, you know, has different ways for, um, for uh, that to apply technology to wellness. And actually, we just had a, a full spread in uh, Forbes Japan. I'll oh, send you the link. I would love it. Um, it's really great. Uh, it's like just uh, a really great um, uh, overview of, of just the way that we think about wellness and well-being in the future. I, I would love it. I'll make sure that it's linked to the, the article that goes with this video so that people have okay. access to that. Yeah, for sure. So what are your greatest concerns when you think about tech and all the things we've talked about, you know, decreasing suffering, advancing wellness, advancing human flourishing, so that whole continuum. What concerns do you have about the use of tech? Well, um, I, I think that the biggest, one of the biggest things that has got to be properly solved is um, neuroethics and, and uh, data. And, you know, right now, depending on how you look at the definition, it's like many people, so basically the only health data that is HIPAA protected is health data between you and your doctor. So any other app that you're using, your Aura, your, you know, like anything, your app, your Apple Health Kit, none of that's HIPAA. Mm -hmm. It's only HIPAA if it's between you and your doctor. And you're talking about in the U.S. right now. Are you finding that same thing across? Uh, Europe has a little bit more, but they also, you know, their idea of data privacy really is around GDPR. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are, it's around emails and stuff like that. But it's like your email address is child's play compared to your um, bio data. Um, and neuro data that is coming off of a lot of the apps. You know, and that being said, um, I don't know about you, but the number of times I've been frustrated by HIPAA and how it has gotten in the way of me getting my data. <laughs> you know, like I, I don't think that's the, you know, we need, basically what we need is we need an ability for um, people to uh, own their data and as a result of owning it, to have the ability to tag it, public, private, and for sale, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they can decide what to do with it. Um, you know, recently Chile just passed a very broad ranging um, laws on neurodata, um, and basically have said that neurodata can never be used commercially. Mm -hmm. I think that's a mistake. Um, because as the rest of the world starts to upgrade, basically it means that people in Chile, you know, will be sort of, you know, at some point permanently second class, mm -hmm. um, you know, as people start to augment, if that law stays intact. And so what we need today is we need a system that gives us the balance between uh, ownership and um protection mm -hmm. and uh and in order to deal with privacy mm -hmm. um, because like your today the way you use your phone and the the way that you use not what you say but on your phone or on your keyboard the the difference in the tension between keys um can track cognitive decline and so right now you know this data isn't it's all over the place mm -hmm. But if it's ever consolidated, it gives such a perfect fit of you, psychological fit of you, mentally and um, so psychologically and physically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that it has to be something where you know it won't be used against you. You know, you have control over it. But also, you know, you get to allow it to be used so that we can start to get the kind of data sets that allow for innovation. Um, and so we have to find the balance between the two. So I think, um, you know, solving this dilemma is one of the most important things that needs to happen in the next five years. Um, as you know, more of this data comes online, um, there's going to be, uh, I'm an advisor 
at Brain Mind, mm -hmm. and uh, we're having a conference next year at Asilomar um, to you know to put out um, guidance on um, neuroethics, but in a way like looking for that balance between innovation um, and you know um, protection. Mm -hmm. Because if it right. goes too far one way or another, then nobody wins. Right, right. I can totally see the paradox and I can totally see the reason for both um, innovation and protection. And I can also see the, the dil kind of not dilemma is not the right word, but the, the challenges, the issues with um, a person deciding and um, like what is their state of well-being when they decide it. And so how that also could affect their decision in that process. Yeah. And then, of course, if someone doesn't have the capacity to make the decision, you know, what happens then to that data, whether it's because they're children or, for, you know, for whatever reason. So I can see all the complexity you know, that's going to be and, and why it's so important, as you say, because there's so much data now. It links to the, convert, or the comment that you made earlier, I think, between all of this, the sea of data that we're in, but very little insight and how, how much of this could be more insightful or more insight based if we had more um, guideposts mm. that allow, you know, that help us ethically and responsibly use data. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that before. So I'm glad you're, you're bringing that into this conversation. Yeah, um, I, I think one thing that's going to happen that people are are going to be surprised about is I think that the recent data conversations um, that are coming out of the Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. um, aftermath, I think that young consumers who were really indifferent for a long time about their data are going to get uh, almost mercenary about it, hmm. no matter where they fall on their their beliefs you know the like the young people across the us all sort of see the same things they're digital natives they you know they um they're really different than you and i uh in many ways and i think you know i think that there's like a uh you know third order effect on how they're going to think about um their personal information um, as say, a result of this. When you say third order effect, what do you mean by that? Well, it's sort of like most people. So a lot of what I do is that I, um, I range really far. So it's almost like, you know, it's like I look at the stars and I see constellations. So I see things that are, that don't look like they're connected, but I think that they lead to, um, you know, uh, there's the first order effects, which is like, you know what the thing's about the conversation is was about the overturning of roe v wade um but i think like the second and third order effects like down here there's young people no matter what their belief system is as it relates to roe v wade who now are really tracking who is going to be doing what with their data mm -hmm. and so i think you're going to see you know once the tools arrive that allow them to join data unions, um, that allow them to tag their data as public, private, or for sale. I think as soon as we give them the tools to express leverage against the platforms, I think they will do it hmm. um, in a really dramatic way that people don't expect. And it's because you know this event over here uh, is in the news a lot. Right. Right, that makes sense. That's fascinating. Do you see any organizations or technologies right now starting to apply that model of, um, you said, I'm gonna make sure I get this right, you said public? Public, private. Or for sale. Or for sale. Yeah, do you I see think anyone? Use, you know, um, there's some data unions in Europe. Okay. And I think that's where you're going to see um, the initial ones really come from um, because the, you know, the EU will get behind privacy. Um, and then once they get a real handle on understanding um, neuro and bio data um, and what isn't covered by 
you know, medical privacy. Um, I think that something will come out of there mm. and the U.S. companies will be forced. You know, an example of this would be right now Europe is saying to Apple, um, your lightning, you know, like the little, like the lightning, mm. it's wasteful. You have to start selling the, um, you have to start being um, compatible with all of the other handsets. Mm. So that's percolating right now. Um, and, you know, Apple might be able to fight it off, uh, but Europe feels so strongly about climate uh, that they're probably going to, I, I think it's possible that um, they could come down that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, one of the things that does just happen in the EU is that they come down on something and then you lose a whole region if you don't comply. Um, and so I think the data unions that you see in uh, the UK uh, where they're just figuring out how they might work. I think, you know, we'll see more data control for neuro and bio data in Europe first. And that's where the models and the, you know, how these things actually work will get will get um, created first. Um, and then probably uh, people will pick them up and move them over to the US. Got it, okay. So when you take a big step back, and you are, um, because, and, and you know, I just know from our conversations how deep your passion is for hu human flourishing and, and decreasing suffering and that whole continuum that we started that conversation with. When you take a big step back from all of this, um, how do you foresee technology bringing about a sea change in wellness and flourishing for all? And I, and I, I, I purposefully include the for all in that question because um, I think often there there is opportunity and accessibility for some, but really not for all. Um, so, you know, beyond what we've said so far, how do you see there being a sea change mm. in technology? Well, I mean, one of the things about technology is that it is all on exponential curves. Mm. And what those curves do is they drive down cost. That is their nature. Now they don't necessarily drive down price, but they always drive down cost. Um, so it's like, you know, this, here's my cell phone, this, you know, uh, two, you know, a decade ago, uh, well, actually two decades ago, like when these first came out, they were $15,000 in this big, mm -hmm. you know, and now everybody, and only a few had them. Now everybody has one. Um, and I mean, this is an advanced iPhone, but lower level Android, Android phones and other smartphones are starting to proliferate around the world, including across Asia and Africa or places in Asia that you might not think and across Africa. Um, and so I think eventually everything, um, becomes more accessible. Um, you know, what, and, and I really do believe that, um, I really do that, believe that games are really going to become tools for wellness and well-being, for mental health, mm -hmm. uh, for purpose, passion, exploration. Um, uh, so I think there's that. Another thing I think is um, I think that the world itself is a giant canvas for intentionality. You know, um, I there's a company that I'm in love with. Uh, called spatial and uh, they do spatial audio. And so basically it's surround sound. Um, but the way that it works is that you can get, you know, speakers out of Best Buy, um, you know, like off the shelf speakers because it's a software platform and you can install them in a conference room and um, you can create a soundscape like under the conference table, you can make it sound like all the people sitting at the conference room, like there's a stream under the table. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, one of the things is that, you know, human beings actually evolved in places where there was sound all around us. Our built environment is not designed to bring us joy. It's not designed to soothe our souls or even just our nervous systems. Mm -hmm. You know, and so we have, we live in these spaces that are not designed for our health. 
they were designed to sort of like well warehouse people mm-hmm. you know at the beginning of of agricultural and then the industrial revolution revolution um so i think that there's a great opportunity to use technology to improve the spaces that we have and to start design designing spaces that actually suit us more um i think also the real big opportunity is um i don't think i think mm, i think using technology to understand and leverage our biology better so an example would be you know like one of the things i think about this is very big picture and i'm sorry i'm going a little bit out on a tangent right, right. i'm 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 listening i'm really <laughs> what you have to say. well it's like you know i spent a lot of time around people who were uh, working on ai mm-hmm. oh i have a meeting in a moment um uh hold on let me just uh, uh Uh, let me just tell her I lost. Um, I think one of the things that will, uh, happen is that, um, so I spent a lot of time talking to people working on AI and currently the, the, thinking around AI as it relates to us is that um, there's either sort of like fear or there's apathy um, in that, you know, AI thinks in a certain way. And when people think about, you know, advanced general intelligence and sentient AI, that's like, there's like this inevitability that, you know, there's no way that we can match that kind of intelligence uh or they're sort of like hand waving like everything's going to be okay or they're sort of like a you know a response it's like you know well let's drill holes in our skulls and add chips to add intelligence Hmm. but i think you know we have a great deal of biological intelligence you know we have in you know we have um embodied and extended cognition that we really haven't put any effort into at all Mm -hmm. for understanding amplifying optimizing and personalizing i think as a species we can have a significant increase over the next 20 years in our intelligence if we just understand ourselves better Mm -hmm. Um, and then i think that has you know um you know that's going to have blast radius effects of you know improving our emotional health improving our social health um and then on you know our physical health um you know when we really see that sort of mind body connection because that would become very clear if we turn all of our creativity towards and our technology towards understanding that, um, that we're going to get an up leveling in health, um, an up leveling in social connection an up leveling in mental health and an overall up leveling in human intelligence that, you know, we can't even imagine now. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think also it's like, we really better get our act together before, um, you know, the sentient AIs arrive, we better know who we are, what we're doing here and what's special about being human by then, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, um, because we're going to have to make our case. Um, so I'm sorry, I have to go. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. And I could talk to you for days, you know, that, so I just want to. Um, you, you are one person who always inspires. You are, you are very inspiring to talk to. I'm glad that there are people like you thinking about what you're thinking about. And thank you for sharing with the rest of us. I really appreciate it. And um, I will definitely be talking to you soon. Great. Thank you. I'll see you at GWI. For sure. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.